So. Okay, so yeah, it is shared, and I want to welcome our Facebook viewers to the U-Turn show. Um, we got about two minutes before the radio show starts, so... Yeah, so it should be, be live on your page too, Kendra. And in about a minute, I'm going to switch the microphones to the radio show so you won't be able to hear me until uh the show starts but you'll be able to hear the prompt and everything that starts the show matter of fact i'm about i'm about to do that now What do y'all do over there? Okay. Uh-uh. I probably got to approve it. I don't want to lose them. One second. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the U-Turn Show once again. Uh, it is Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Uh, here at Awesome Radio. Uh, make sure if you haven't already, visit www.wbisawesomeradio.org and download our apps either on the Google Play, the mm -hmm. Apple Store, or Alexa. Uh, also, uh, make sure you uh, call in the 252-756-2008 if you want to interact with the show today is a very special uh show today um i have a very strong and uh determined guest uh my sister keandra mcdowell ray how you doing today hello how you doing thank you for I, inviting me i thank you for for tuning in and a lot of people don't know i actually just was informed about uh this situation but uh Kendra McDowell Ray uh, is the sister of our brother, Jeremy uh, McDowell. And Mr. Jeremy McDowell was in, in uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, executed uh, by the Wilmington, uh, Delaware uh, Police uh, Department. And, and this uh, situation happened on september in september of 2015 correct yes all right and once again it it, it got a little uh it got a lot of attention you know locally and and for a while uh you know uh nationally and even you know some global attention but it was pretty much swept under the rug along with a lot of other things so um we're going to 
if I can pull this up real quick so our audience will be able to see this video. And just bear with me. Okay, so just to give y'all uh, a taste of uh, what happened, hope y'all can see this video. And there you see Mr. McDowell, who is a quadriplegic in his wheelchair. He's already been shot one time. And there you hear about 15 shots where Mr. McDowell uh, is shot uh, 15 more times. So uh, we see right there on the tape, uh, I feel, you know, and actually everybody who sees the tape feel like it is senseless. So we're going to let uh, Miss uh, McDowell tell us a little bit about the situation and a little bit about who her brother was. Now, how did that situation uh, come about as far as him being uh, having to have contact with the police? Um, First of all, my brother had... Um Wilmington police knew my brother, you know, my brother was no angel or whatever. He, um, sold a little weed and stuff like that. Um, he had, he'd been to jail before, so he's not, he never was an angel, but he was a good guy. Um, September 23rd, 2015, um, was just a day I will never forget. Um, my brother was actually, um, robbed minutes before the police got there um he was shot during the course of the robbery he was robbed for weed and his money and he was shot in the back of the thigh my brother was already a paraplegic in the wheelchair so he couldn't feel anything from the waist down um i think that he knew that he got shot in the robbery because of course he could hear the shot go off but he couldn't feel it so um he was tussling with the guy or whatever he got robbed the guy ran off how i know this because a daycare worker in the area says she's seen a gentleman ride, run by her daycare and he had braid long braids in his hair she said that's what made her lock put her daycare on lockdown so it was a guy by the name of nate who was working at a detailing shop in the area and he heard the shot he said he stopped detailing the car he came out and he seen my brother knocked out of his wheelchair with his pants down to his ankles he said he went to my brother asked him if he was okay and he said um, my brother said yeah i'm good man um can you help me um flip my wheelchair back over so i can get in the wheelchair um he did he said he did, did just that he flipped the wheelchair back over and he said my brother pulled himself up in the wheelchair um he said he pulled his try to pull his pants up and then he pulled himself back up in the wheelchair and he like pulled his pants up so no, he say asked him again if he was fine, and he said Bam Bam said yes. Um, that's what we call him, Bam Bam. Um, Bam Bam said yes, I'm fine or whatever. He said he left and went back to detailing the car. He said within three minutes he hear all this commotion, all this commotion. So he comes back out, and when he came back out, that's when that video starts. He immediately started recording. Um, it was already seven officers up there. Um, who were trying to get my brother to to get on the ground um in the investigation report some officers was telling him to get out the wheelchair stand up put your hands up um this that and the third he's a paraplegic obviously he can't stand up yeah so the last officer on the scene um came like a yo know, he came like a mad person up the street with a shotgun already aimed and cocked black he caught by um cocked back he came, he ran across one of our one of our busiest streets. He could have got hit or anything. He wasn't worrying about that. He got to my brother. He gave him three commands in a matter of three seconds. Show me your hands. Put your hands up. Give me your hands. Boom. Shot my brother in the neck with a shotgun. In the neck. 
So after he shot my brother, the um the other officers said that they claim this is all an invest investigation report on the Dollar Words DOJ website, everything that I'm saying. Um, the other officer said they was yelling at the officer to take cover, take cover, take cover. We have the scene under control. Mm -hmm. And he said that he never heard the officers because he has he had tunnel vision. Um, after the other, after, um, the first officer who shot my brother in the neck with a shotgun, the other officer shot him 15 more times. Um, the only reason why he stayed up in the wheelchair as long as he did was because the bullets were keeping him up in the wheelchair. The medical examiner stated that just from that shotgun blast, I don't know if anybody's familiar with a shotgun and being shot in the neck. She said that he was already dying. He would have been dead within a matter of eight minutes from the shotgun blast. And that's what happened. It was only four officers who shot. It was a total of eight officers there. It was only four officers who um, shot. Um, four officers were rookie officers or who were being trained that day. Okay. Um, later on, we heard um, that someone had dialed 911 after they heard the shot. They had dialed 911 and said that it's a crazy man. It's a crazy man in a wheelchair. He's waving a gun. He's waving a gun. He has a gun. And um, you hear the 911 operator and the 911 caller going back and forth and back and forth. And about 10 minutes in, you hear the um, 911 operator state that, ma'am, don't go up there to him. Um, they're going to take him out. They're going to take him out when he get there. And um, I question that that part, too, as well. Um, why yeah, would the, had, why would the medical it. examiner say that, that they were going to take him out? That's already they already knew what they were going to do to my brother before he got up there. He stated that um, he was actually having conversations with another 911 operator in the office and they were referring to a different situation. So he wasn't referring to my brother's situation. That's um, what he later, yes, correct. Later okay. on, um, you, if you go to the investigation report, you will hear the interview with the 911 caller. She recanted on her lie when she called 911 and said she's seen him with a gun. He's waving a gun. She said that she never actually seen him with a gun or seen a gun on him. She was going off of the shot that she heard, which was a shot from the robbery. So she was talking about your brother who had been shot. So yep then she she claimed because i listened to that tape too and and she was very adamant hurry up get here this guy's got a gun and he's crazy like you know y'all need to hurry up and get here i'm not going to go close to him and everything like that so i listened to the tape and she was very you know uh, for lack of a word dramatic in talking to the police so um but yeah and still you said there were seven officers already on the scene before and i think y'all call them shotgun joe that's what we call him, Shotgun Joe. His, his name was Joe DeLuce. The officer Joseph who, DeLuce. Yep, that's his name. Okay, Joseph DeLuce ended up shooting your brother within about, you know, seconds. If, if you guys, you know, so watch the video, you see as soon as he approached. Uh, three Mr. seconds. Mr. McDowell, he shot him within three seconds. While others were officers were already on the scene and, and didn't see any need to uh, open fire. Now, um, what what happened uh with officer delos was there any other officers charged uh no um no officers was charged on a state level um we had protests demanding for the feds to come in and investigate which we did have them come in and invest and investigate mm -hmm. um they didn't find anything wrong and um released the officers no justice um they did the attorney general did state two attorney generals did state an investigation report that they felt as though Joseph Deleuze should never be in a position where he is holding or has to have a gun on his person because of his actions. They actually wanted to give him a charge of assault third or third degree assault or something like that, first degree or something. But because we had this law in place in Delaware that states that the only thing an officer has to say or feel is that they felt threatened for their lives and they can shoot you, they can kill you, they can murder you, execute you and get away with it. Even if it's video evidence, even if we got them on recording saying they was going to kill you, they can get away with it. So that's why they claim that no one was charged for executing my brother. And how long did it take them to come to that conclusion? Um... um I want to say on a state level, it was about a year. 
And mm. then the federal, the feds, um, they did their investigation. I want to say in less than 60 days, um, we actually got a call. Obama um, actually sent his administration down here to meet, have me and my family meet in this room in Delaware and to basically tell us that they wasn't charging the cops on the federal level. Okay. And so, and, and, and then in, uh, you know, several of the reports, uh, and you mentioned this as well about, they said your brother did have a gun, but the gun never showed up in the investigation report pictures till about what, two or three years later. I think um, four years later. Exact. Um, what happened was a new witness had came up. First of all, when they, when my brother got executed on September 23rd, 2015, it was three different stories put out from the news that, were, that that's what took place that day. It was, he was wait, no, he was suicidal. He had a self-inflicted gunshot wound um, that he was waving a gun. The last story that they said was that he had, um, that he was reaching for a gun. So mm. they put out three different narratives. From the gate, we already knew that my brother never had a gun that day. He, he didn't have a gun. And, and why, why is that? Because you explained that to me. Because, okay, so the gun that my brother would carry would be a gun that his girlfriend at the time had in her name that mm -hmm. he would carry. Okay. My brother and his supposedly girlfriend got into an argument the day before. And she came and took the gun from him. You know how female men get in arguments, we get petty. Oh, give me yeah. my stuff, give me my stuff, this. So she came and took the gun from my brother. And my brother snatched her pocketbook that day. Okay. Okay. So, so that's how going, he had the, the pocketbook when he Yeah, got and it. it's crazy. It's crazy because the police released information at one point that the girlfriend tried to turn that gun into Wilmington police at one point. Okay. Yeah. And so so what happened was it was a new witness that came about um about four years later. And I went to the attorney general at this time. Her name is Kathleen Jennings. And I, we have held protests at, in front of her house at her front door, demanding that she reopen the case and charge these officers. Well, she ended up reopening the case. And since day one of my brother being executed, I always stated, if he had a gun, where's the picture of the gun? Y'all keep staying and locked into this lie that he had a gun. Where is the picture of this planted gun that y'all placed on my brother? And nobody ever released it. So Kathleen Jennings and her team reopened my brother's case and mm -hmm. did a investigation. And when they did an investigation, we had held protests demanding the same thing that we've been demanding since they want that you charge these officers. And where is the pictures of this supposedly planted gun that y'all claim my brother had on his person? And after she concluded in her investigation that she basically agreed with the former attorney general, Matt Den, all of a sudden they release a picture of this, this rusty gun that doesn't work. They put in a report that the gun didn't work. There's nothing that, yeah, the gun didn't work. And this was four years later. And I asked them, the news came to me and wanted a statement for me. And I said, yeah, I want a question. If this was the gun that they planted on my brother and that they claim my brother have, had why did it take four years for y'all to release this picture of this gun there is her exact words was the doj did not realize that the picture of the gun was not in the initial investigation report the g the doj didn't realize did not realize that the key evidence for them was never released to the public in the investigation report and they even went as far as um, showing a picture of where they found the gun at on uh -huh. my brother. And in the investigation report, one officer said that she had to move the gun. One said they found it in his boxers. One said they found it on the ground by him. They said that his, for one, the, if you watch the video when my brother fell out the wheelchair, his foot stopped his wheelchair from moving. His foot fell behind his chair, so it was no way that his wheelchair would roll or any way, any um, any way or direction. The picture that the DOJ released out to the public with the gun, my brother's wheelchair was crashed up to, in the back of somebody's car 
within six to seven feet away from his body. And the gun was over to the right side of him, the whole wrong side of him. Yep. And I'm going to show this picture because if you see the video, the first video we showed that you saw that uh, Mr. Bam fell out of his wheelchair and his wheelchair remained still. So I'm going to show you this picture. I think that's the one you're talking about. That, that is the exact picture. Away. Yes. So you see the gun. You can't hardly see it. Let me see. You right see there. the gun right there. Um, My brother's body is like six to eight feet away from there. Yeah, the brother's body is way over here. You see the brother's feet right there. So Correct. there's no way, first of all, that the that the gun will end up over there because. If you saw the video, you know, he just fell which right side did he? Yeah. Which side did he fall on? He Correct. On the, yeah, he fell on the left side, so the gun would not be on that side. Correct. So, and um, the wheelchair would not be pushed up to the back of the car because if you go back and watch the video, his foot stopped the wheelchair from moving even a centimeter. His foot was behind the wheel, which stopped it from moving at all. Yeah, so that so do you think that that, that scene was staged? Yeah, because yes, for one, my brother's body was laying out on the ground for almost four hours that day, okay? His okay. body was underneath of a white sheet. When they first came to the scene, they made came up there and made a makeshift shift tent, tent around the scene so nobody could see anything. Okay, okay. So that, that gave them per perfect and ample opportunity to kind of stage it the way it's they not, want. Yeah, it's not kind of because we know that he didn't have a gun. So where did this gun come from? I Dream of Jeannie didn't just drop off this gun. Like, where did it come from? The only people who was there was my brother's dead body and the police. And you mentioned something that that, that gun was, was found in another case? No, not the gun. So one of the officers involved, Corporal McCall, who was involved, um, he's actually been indicted because, and my brother got executed in 2015. In 2018, he shot a 16-year-old uh, four times with a gun. After they did an investigation in there, they found out that he changed the barrel of the gun in that scene, in that crime. And so one of the officers who were... Who the was main, killed. one of the officers who shot my brother... Mm -hmm. Yeah, was involved with uh, indictment for changing the barrel of his gun. Okay. For shooting so, another un another black team. Okay, so we're gonna we got we got to take a quick station break, but we're gonna come back uh, with a little bit more of the aftermath of the the execution of Jeremy McDowell. Uh, but this is the U Turn Show. Stay tuned with us. Uh, we have our special guest. Kendra McDowell Ray, uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is George Truly, Pastor Nell Smith Ward, and I am excited, and I would love to invite you to my album release party. That's right, Saturday, April 30th, what time? 3 p.m., location, State Street Community Church, downtown Raleigh. The address is 1200 South State Street, downtown Raleigh. This is a ticketed event. For more information, 919-924. 1945. Along with me, our special guest will be Elder Jarrell Small. You don't want to miss this grand occasion. This is Pastor Nell Smith Ward inviting you to my album release party. God bless. Jesus came by and he touched me and he washed my sins away. Partial funding for this program is brought to you by Meemaw's Liquidation. Meemaw's Liquidation is where you can find furniture, home decor, appliances, tools, toys, and much more for less than the actual retail costs. Meemaw's Liquidation, 400 North Green Street, Greenville, 252-364-8121. That's 252-364-8121. Meemaw's Liquidation, open Monday through Friday, 10 o'clock a.m. 
a.m. to 6 o'clock p.m. And Saturday, 10 o'clock a.m. to 5 o'clock p.m. Find what you are looking for at Mima's Liquidation. Brand new items at liquidated prices. 252-4-8121. Thank you, Mima's Liquidation, for your support. And uh, we are back here on the U-Turn Show at Awesome Radio 106.9 FM here in uh, Greenville, North Carolina. Make sure you once again visit the website, www.wbisawesomeradio.org. Here with our special guest, Kendra McDay, McDowell Ray, uh, who keeps the fight, keeps the fight for justice uh, for her brother, Jeremy McDowell, who was murdered by the Wilmington police. Uh, in 2015. Real quick, a couple of comments. Jay Renee said they staged the crime scene in this case. It's outrageous. Once again, our sister Jay Renee, these Wilmington's officers have repeated fences against the people. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, my father, Roger Taylor, says, keep speaking the truth. Christ is on the side of truth. Thank I you thank all uh, for tuning in. And uh, Jay Renee's comment uh, brings something else we talked about to mind. Uh, you said that the police knew who your brother was. I think uh, you discussed a previous incident uh, where your brother uh, was kind of mishandled by the police. Yes. Um, when we was like, this was my brother before he had just gotten into his wheelchair, got shot and was paralyzed or whatever. And um, the police, he was on Rodney street. That's the street that we was born on. And um the police pulled up on him. He had two bags of weed on him. They put him in a police car. And we thinking that they took him down turnkey before the two bags of marijuana that he had. What's, what's turnkey? Yeah. I'm sorry. Wilmington Police Station. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, you guys. Yeah, 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 you we know, thinking we got, that they I knew what you was talking about. Yeah. <laughs> we thinking okay. that they took him to Wilmington Police Station. Well, I get a phone call that the police has your brother at Byers School, which is about three blocks away from um Rodney Street. Okay. So I run around there. I'm all out of breath. They dump my brother out the wheelchair in the middle of the school and put his wheelchair at a stop sign and told him he better find his best way to get in to get to his wheelchair. If I wouldn't have came there, my brother would have had to drag himself from the middle of the school to the end of it to go get his wheelchair. Shotgun Joe knows my brother. They have had plenty of altercations to the point where he has went on people pri property to go up steps to go see my brother and go through his pockets and see if he has drugs on him or mm -hmm. or something like that like shotgun joe joseph deluce he he's very familiar with my brother he's like been on the force he's and he was antique at the time he's been on the force for a while okay and that's what happens a lot of time in the small towns like small town on from goldsboro it was the same issues happening where police come into the neighborhoods and they know, you know, they, they, they have a familiarity with people who may have been in trouble, uh, which still doesn't give them a right to harass them every time they see them. But also you mentioned something else. I think you said the night that your brother was killed, uh, you oh, and yeah. Emily so, were putting yeah, up we a had a, um, a we had a, a visual kind of visual on Rodney street, um, after everything happened and, Everybody else had went home that night. So it was just me and my mom. Um, I was sitting in between two houses and we had like a candle visual set up for my brother with like pictures of him and stuff. And it was like two o'clock in the morning. Um, we were just sitting out there. Next thing you know, police just come out of nowhere. When I say out of nowhere, I mean no police vehicles at all. Next thing I know, I hear my mother screaming, Kiki, do not move. I'm like, why like i and i looked down and there was beans red beans pointed at me and my mother that night it it was so many cops i had to have been like 15 cops and i guess the neighbors and stuff heard the commotion and everybody came outside and only thing you seen was like people's camera lights on their phone like people just immediately started recording this was like two o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. my mom said that that like her her whole life flashed be like before her eyes, like 
it was a very scary encounter. Y'all had just executed my brother. Y'all already knew that that's just something that we do in Wilmington. When somebody passes away, we do a candle visual and might play some music or whatever. Mm -hmm. But me and my mother was out there by ourselves. And they came out there with shotgun, shotguns out of all things. I remember saying this. Out of all things, shotguns. And, and what, was their, the, what was their reason that they, they gave claim, you They claimed that they got a 911 call that the guy next door was beating up his girlfriend or something. Mm -hmm. But like I said, you got a 911 call for that, but you're putting beans on me and my mother. On the mother and sister of somebody who y'all just executed. What are y'all doing here? Mm -hmm. So after that, you know, I, I know that, you know, you were very involved in protests, you and your family and, you know, other community members. Um, what what type of help did y'all get or what type of opposition uh, did y'all get, you know, during that time? Um, we immediately my brother um got buried. We buried my brother. No, we had a funeral for my brother, but he didn't get buried for 30 days after the um funeral because um we hired for a private autopsy to be done on my brother. Mm -hmm. So um, I started protesting like in October, like October 17th, I do believe was the first um, protest. We had so many people come and say that they were helping and that they were there to support us. And one individual specifically, um, he helped get like, um, our banners that we needed for protesting. Um, he bought me a mega horn. Um, he bought food for my family while everything was going on. Um, just did stuff that I thought at the time and me and my family at the time thought that it was out of the compassion of his heart. Well, after the lawsuit was final, we were sitting in my cousin's house with our lawyers going over the end result for the lawsuit. And he popped up a knock on the door. He popped up at my family's house with receipts, receipts that added up to $20,000 that he wanted to get paid for assisting us and helping us with fighting for justice for my brother in the beginning. And I, my mom was like, if that's what it takes for me to never see that man again, then give him that money. I just thought that it was sickening. I mean, he have even had receipts for, for, for pads, like for, for food, for cups, for, for everything. So he, he, he was like a Trojan horse, basically. And, I never thought that that would happen. And let's, let's talk about, you know, the, we got about three minutes before the next break, but let's talk about the settlement for a minute, because you said that you were the one who had to negotiate that. How, how was that experience for you? Oh my gosh. It was a headache. It was because for one, when the lawsuit i'm feeling i'm thinking at the time that i'm going that there wasn't a civil and a criminal like i'm learning as i go so the whole okay. time i'm sitting in negotiations i'm thinking that i'm in there for these officers to get charged like i know it's going to be a payout but i thought the payout comes with the officers being charged mm -hmm. and i that wasn't what the case was so um negotiation was very hard because i didn't come in there with a dollar amount or anything like that i was coming there to find out what charge was these officers going to be charged with and how long it was going to take for them to go to jail mm -hmm. and it was very different it was it was a very different experience um, my mother was um ended up being incarcerated so she had to sign power of attorney over to me to go back and forth with these lawyers which <laughs> Okay. Yeah. What was it like? I, I know you mentioned one thing that kind of held it up for a while that you didn't want to do that they wanted you to do as a part of this settlement. Um, they actually wanted me to sign a gag order. Um, they a gag order is something like the one for me. It would have been um that I wouldn't be able to speak on my brother's name after this lawsuit. Like no protest. Like like we can do memorials and stuff, but no fighting for him. And that held up the 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 um the lawsuit for about a week or so because I wasn't going for that. There's no way that you're going to execute my brother and then tell me that I can't fight for him. I can't like no, it's not happening. So it was it was very interesting. Then they had came up with a dollar amount that the city of Wilmington wanted to pay two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And I remember they came up with a final amount of $500,000 and they told me that the city's insurance company will only cover $250,000. So they would have to go to the taxpayers to get $250,000 and make it 500,000. And I told them, no, 
Well, my lawyers at the time told me that if I don't agree to $500,000, that they will go to the prison and get my mother to sign off on this dollar amount. And I pulled that nice, pretty piece of paper, that power of attorney <laughs> over and said, you're not going to ask her nothing because she signed her life over to me. And that was your lawyers or the state's lawyers who said Oh, that, that was my lawyers. Yeah, so they were pretty much just trying to get the situation. The Delaware way. Mm -hmm. No, it's over. not the situation. It's the Delaware way. <laughs> okay, so we got another take a, a quick uh, station break again, uh, but we're going to be uh, right back to talk about, you know, what you're doing to continue to fight uh, for justice. We'll be right back. Partial funding for this program is brought to you by The Breakfast Bar, Comfort Food, 605 Abramall Avenue, Greenville, 252-565-8310. Open Tuesday through Saturday, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Sunday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., closed on Monday. Dine in or take out. No delivery. 252-565-8310. Chicken and waffles, shrimp and grits. The Breakfast Bar is a Southern breakfast and brunch restaurant located at 605 Abramall Avenue, Greenville, 252-565-8310. Comfort food. The Breakfast Bar is not just a restaurant. It's a place where family and friends can have a wonderful time while enjoying a multitude of delicious southern inspired breakfast and brunch dishes it's breakfast and brunch for the soul comfort food thank you the breakfast bar for your support Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is George Truly, Pastor Nell Smith Ward, and I am excited, and I would love to invite you to my album release party. That's right, Saturday, April 30th, what time? 3 p.m., location, State Street Community Church, downtown Raleigh. The address is 1200 South State Street, downtown Raleigh. This is a ticketed event. For more information, 919-924. 1945. Along with me, our special guest will be Elder Jarrell Small. You don't want to miss this grand occasion. This is Pastor Nell Smith Ward inviting you to my album release party. God bless. Jesus came and he touched me and he washed my sins away. I started out and I started shouting. Yeah. Uh, yes, and we are back uh, with uh, the U-Turn Show here on Awesome Radio 106.9 FM here in Greenville, Aidenville, uh, Aiden, mm -hmm. uh, and the surrounding areas. Uh, we're back with Kendall uh, Kian. Magdo, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, uh, okay. And uh, I assume you're talking to your husband. Uh, yes, he's but, like, are you okay? I'm live. <laughs> okay, yeah. So real quick, Christina Kelly, who's uh, been very instrumental with you uh, in fighting for justice, says the way the police have harassed the McDowell family proves malicious intent, and the harassment has continued. Which brings me to another part of the conversation. I do want to uh, touch on how, what you know, what type of harassment have you? I receive. I know you mentioned, you know, being sued and threatened. So give the public um, a little bit. So we'll work it up um, to the <laughs> point of being sued by the attorney general okay. and deputy attorney general of the state. Okay. Um, um, in the beginning, it was just like death threats, like even like through the news outlets, social media pages and stuff like this death threats. And then I started receiving sticky notes on my car windows when I come out in the morning that told me that if I don't if I don't stop doing what I'm doing, I'm going to end up like my brother dead. Um, someone was tampering with my vehicle. So I used to have to get like my uncle to check my brake lines and make sure that it was safe for me to ride my car every day. Mm -hmm. um, the po one police officer took the my tag off my car and um, told me my my tag was fake and I had to drive home with no tag. Um, um it's it's it, it just doesn't stop um we joined um another another guy by the name of lamar moses um got killed while sleeping in his car in delaware and um we joined with the family to fight for justice for him me and my best friend got sued by the attorney general and deputy attorney general um and ended up in a chancery court 
Okay, so why um, did why did they sue you? Um, because we were protesting at the deputy attorney general's front door. Well, not on his front door, but in the street at his house. Okay. And um, we were demanding for them to um release the the investigation report to let us know what is going on. It's been long enough. Um, they kept, how long was that after the execution of Lamar Moses? Oh, oh, okay, okay. That was that we got sued by the deputy attorney general, and attorney general, for um, protesting with the uh, Lamar Moses family. Yeah, um, I know the process. I've been through it. So I'm like, right now they're just playing, playing around. Like we need to apply pressure now. So we protest there just for them to release the investigation report. Let let transparency is basically why we was protesting. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we got sued. So what what was the the result of the lawsuit? Oh my gosh, they was trying to send my megahorn to jail. They was trying to set, <laughs> they, <laughs> seriously, they was trying to set a precedent, like okay. not just for Delaware. When a precedent is state is set in any court, it's country, like worldwide. So mm -hmm. if any other protesters had was sued by anybody for protesting, our case would have been the cases that the attorney general used to prosecute the protesters. So it was just, we was just like fighting ACU. ACLU hired us a, a phenomenal attorney and we still have her. She's our lawyer now. Okay. Um, and she got it out the way. They was more so worried about me and my best friend, Christina, um, getting away from the mom Moses family. And they wanted to um, make it so that I, nobody could use a make horn while protesting. Okay. And actually just like, uh your brother, Ms. McDowell's case, no, no officers were prosecuted in, in that case. In no, um, that's, that's right. what happens in Delaware. No officers ever held accountable. Um, actually they're able to leave our force and join other forces without, yeah, nothing. Okay. So that happens you, here. You mentioned another case, Harris, I think the last name was. Yahim Harris. Yahim Harris was where were any officers uh convicted in that case? Well, um um Corp um McCall was indicted, but not for shooting Lamar um the mom Moses. Yahim Harris. He was indicted because they found out that he changed the barrel of his handgun. Okay. So okay. he had uh his personal use hand handgun using it as a service weapon okay okay so that's why he was indicted no officer has been um indicted well we have two now um one officer by the names of waters just was indicted um for slamming an african-american man's head up against um freezer doors in one of our corner store and we just had another officer be brought up on charges for sending new photos to a 17 year old which started when she was 15. he sent new photos in his police uniform okay and then a week later they stopped his car and he was in a car with a guy and got caught the car had guns and drugs inside of it okay so that just goes to show you know police officers are not above reproach you know they are human and they and they do uh mistakes now let's talk about what you are doing now we we talked about um the website in this uh i have it up on the screen jm police reform now dot com now what is what is your goal uh with 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 that initiative um from day one the goal has always been that there will never be another jeremy mcdowell and if so the family wouldn't fight as hard and ended up with a result like my family has um the jeremy mcdowell police reform now is uh um we're working on it being a nonprofit. um we're we just want meaningful police reform we want meaningful legislation passed and bills that will actually protect us we the people and not protecting the police because it seems like the police get away with everything here and it's not just here this is um global yeah yeah and so that's what, just what, what types of things do you think that might need to change you know, in, in Delaware that you see, but also, you know, you know, worldwide, I mean, you know, nationwide um, that you've experienced. I think um, the FOP, the Fraternal Order of Police mm -hmm. needs to go. Okay. Sorry. It needs to go because these people are put in these positions to protect police by any means necessary. 
whether right or wrong. Nothing good has come out of the um, FOP. Every time we turn around, they're, they don't want police reform. They're backing their officers 110%. And most, nine times out of 10, these officers are wrong. Mm -hmm. So I believe that my opinion that the, FO, the FOPs around the globe need to go because it's an uphill battle. We have been fighting to get a bill passed by the name of um, SB 149. And the FOP has been fighting against it, which is why we don't have this bill now. SB 149, could you could you explain like the details? So we have what you call here in Delaware is Leo Board. It's the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. Okay. The easiest way for me to explain it is police officers' Bibles. Right. Um, it is an order of protection that sets the police above anybody and anything. Say, even if you have a lawyer that you hired, like in my brother's case, we hired lawyers. They were unable to go into police officers' records to see if this is something that these officers have done before and like here or anywhere else. It's something that protects protects the police by any means necessary. Say if you get smacked upside your head by the police officer, you should really be able to Google to find out, hmm, did this officer do this to somebody else or... Or not, you know what I'm saying, to find a track record to see if this is something that this officer repeat repeatedly does, if yes. he's a crooked officer, basically. Yes. And Leo Bohr here protects that. SB 149 would stop that. It will make it so we can have civilian review boards, so we don't have the police investigating the police. The problem around the world is we have the police investigating the, the police. And if you think about it, if you have a group of kids and you leave them unsupervised with no adult supervision, nobody to answer to, these kids are going to go crazy. And that is, is exactly what police officers around the nation are doing. That's and it path. needs to it needs to be stopped. It really does. Yeah, Leah Poor. I think uh I think when I was up there uh at, at the Justice for All Day, uh I think my brother uh Hani Salam was mentioning Leah Poor. And so that that gives me, you know, a deeper insight because you know a lot of people will mention Leah Poor. I was like, who is Leah? Poor? We have the strict the strictest one in the world here in Delaware. It's but you have to realize Delaware was the last state to abolish slavery. Let's let's take it there. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of our laws, which what I learned by fighting for justice and stuff, a lot of our laws haven't been looked at, haven't been changed, haven't been updated since 1960 something, 1901, if you want to take it back there. So we are working off of laws that were built to 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 run slaves, honestly. Exactly. Exactly. And that's a problem. And you mentioned, you know, I think at the time, the police chief uh, and the mayor, uh, what were their what were your experiences with them dealing with your situation, but also dealing with other situations that you are, you know, fighting, fighting for justice on? So when everything happened with my brother it was a different police chief and a different mayor at the time, um, they went on national TV and said that they felt as though what their officers did was what they were supposed to do. Now, remember, this is even before the video got released of what happened to my brother. Okay. They did a video within, I mean, like, my brother was executed by 3, I want to say like 3.30, by 3.40, they was on the news giving their, their little speech. Okay. And that's when the video came out. That's when the second story got released of what happened to my brother. So what did they say in response to the video? Did they that, make a statement? They said that that he was a suicidal man and he had shot himself. That was the first report. That he was a suicidal man and it, he had shot himself and he was something. And then the video got out. And they said they said he was a suicidal man and he was waving a gun. This was before the video got out. It was released. Mm -hmm. When the video was released, they said, oh, he was reaching for a gun. Now, my thing with people in Delaware in general is God blessed all of us with these two things right here. Uh-huh. And these two things. 
why is it so hard for people to take the time out and watch the video? Take the time out to read the investigation report. Because if you watch the video, you will see that, for one, my brother was never suicidal. He was in a wheelchair. My brother was the happiest person. You couldn't tell him nothing. He did willies and stuff all day long, okay? He was never suicidal. And it just doesn't make sense. You don't see him waving a gun. And you don't see him reaching a gun, reaching for a gun in the video. What he was doing in the video is something that he always does. When a person is a paraplegic, they feel as though they always have to stretch, stretch, hmm. stretch, stretch. So when you see him like lifting up in his wheelchair, that's just something that something that he always has done since day one of him being a paraplegic. Hmm. So I already knew when they put that that narrative out that he was reaching for a gun. I'm like, no, he was stretching and trying to pull up his pants. Yeah. And if you know, I, I watched the video and I watched the as as the Department of Justice called it, the processed video which kind of slows everything down and you see him pulling up his pants but they tried to slow it down to make it as if he's reaching for something which you know i i you know i, I kind of know how they you know that perception that it slows down you know but in in real time you can see he's just readjusting himself as you say uh you know getting himself together and mind you at that time he was already shot in the neck anyway and that's what people what i want people to understand by that time he was already shot in the neck with a shotgun the neck if you get shot in your neck with a shotgun i don't think yeah. you will be able to you won't even be able to understand what anybody is screaming exactly. at you at that time you're yeah. dying and you're dying slowly and you're definitely not trying to pull a gun even if you had one you, know? you are in pain you don't have you don't have the energy to pull a gun on nobody you're, you're, you're in shock you know you're in shock. and my brother wasn't a big guy neither he was as skinny as me so mm -hmm. he like that listen after everything happened with my brother, we went we went to the medical examiner's office to, to get to get his body released to the funeral home so that we can start the process of um, having a funeral and burying him. They refused to release my brother's body. We got a hold of the governor and the governor immediately told them to release his body. Congo's funeral home and came and got my brother's body and took it to their funeral home. And when they got there, we got on the phone and called like, um, I know this may be weird, but is it possible if a few of my family members come up there to inspect Bam Bam's body? Okay. Jeremy McDowell's body. Uh -huh. And they said, let me call you back. They called us back and said, yeah, but one thing, we're going to have to have you guys sign documentation that you guys do understand that this is the way his body got to us and we have not touched it because his body was so tore up. I sent you pictures of his body. Yes, yes. And um, that was an experience that I would never forget looking at my brother's body. And um, you got to remember, he had just left the medical examiner's office. By that time, his his head was already separated from his skull. Um, It was guts and and stuff leaking from everywhere but it was just a process that we had to do we knew how many shots we heard inside in the video we knew how many shots but we wanted to count them so that we were speaking facts when we started this process of fighting for him and you've seen the pictures they number up to 17 that's not including the shotgun blast because when you're shot with a shotgun there's little pellets that is released inside your body so they and then the one shot from the robbery, which was on the back of the thigh. A lot of people think normally when somebody is shot, sometimes they have a bowel movement on their self or they pee their self. Yeah. No, if you saw that video down, it's blood. He got yeah. shot in the back of his thigh. So this whole time while they're they're finishing finishing killing him, he was already shot in the back of his thigh, sitting in a pool of blood. It wasn't poop, it wasn't pee, it was blood yeah. from him being shot in the back of his thigh. And we, we went up there, me, my mother, my uncle, my cousin, um, we went up there and we inspected his body from head to toe. We turned his body over. We 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 did everything to, just to see. And you got to think about this. Like, if you don't take nothing for me but this tonight, when a hunter is hunting in the wild, they don't shoot a wild animal as many times as they shot my brother, September 23rd, 2015. They didn't. It was roadkill. 
the 911 operator already stated in the investigation report that they were going to take my brother out when he got there. Okay. The 911 caller already set the narrative, which I believe she should have been in jail as well because she lied and said he had a gun. And then later on when interviewed, she stated she never seen a gun. She was going off the gunshot that she heard. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's crazy. Shotgun Joe should have immediately went to jail because his other officers was there on the scene longer than him. Instead of he coming to the scene and asking questions and find out where he should be placed in this, he came to execute my brother exactly what the 911 operator said. And he was never dispatched to the area. He showed up on his own to the area. Okay. And within three seconds exactly, he shot Jeremy McDowell in the neck with a shotgun. Wow. So we got, we, we're going to keep it going, you know, beyond the radio. Cause I got a couple of more questions to ask you, but we got about two minutes on the radio for our listening audience. What is it that you want the, the, the audience to know? How can they get in contact if they do want to, you know, help continue or, um, you can, um, find me on Facebook. Um, I am married now. I got married last year. Um, my name on Facebook is Keandra. Thank you. It's Keandra Ray. Um, you can go to the Jeremy um, Mc, JM Police Reform Now dot com, and um, we have a Facebook page called Jeremy Bam McDowell that I'm very active on, as well as members of my family. Um, listen, I'm I'm around. Um, inbox me if you want to talk. I will give you my number. I am an open book to this. Please don't be afraid to ask me any questions. If you didn't understand something that I said on this show, inbox me. I'll give you my number, and we can go back all through this again if that's what you need. But I ask that if it's another family in your area that's going through this, I ask that you hold them and stand right beside them and help them fight for justice because this is a depressing fight and it's a lonely fight and we need y'all. Definitely, man. And, and once again, I just want to thank our guest, uh, you know, Mrs. Keandra McDowell Ray uh, for just being, uh, you know, just a, just a catalyst for justice and change and not allowing, you know, the intimidation, uh, the, the, the formidable, the, 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 the formidable nature of, you know, trying to go against a system that's, you know, continuously, as, as you said, you know, justifying itself, uh, whether it's the, you know, those, those Leopold laws or even, you know, the unspoken laws of, you know, the fraternal brotherhood, why, by not allowing police to go against their brother, even when they know they are wrong, there's, you know, I, I talk about a, a thin blue line, you know, that's never crossed because, uh, you know, uh, officers have this once again, brotherhood. So um, once again, if you guys are listening, if you guys know any resources to help or if you are interested in, in helping police reform, not only in Delaware, but anywhere yeah, in, in the in the United States and are interested in, you know, hearing uh, more about this story you can reach out to her but i thank you guys for listening we're going to be back with you next week uh once again we thank miss mcdowell for coming thank you for this program is brought to you by the okay can you hear me mm -hmm. yeah oh, okay so, yeah and um they said uh j renee says they executed bam and it's disgusting uh my father wants to get be strong in the lord in the power of his might and aaron picasso ray I, I i guess that's uh your husband hose up yes. uh thank you so much uh for for tuning in so how how has you know losing bam affected your family um the the main person that i try to hold close to me is my mother um my mother in the beginning before all this happened she had an addiction um it's like every since everything happened with my brother it's got worse um and i just try to hold her close i try to bear with her and understand you know that at the end of the day this is my brother but that is her first son that's her first child you know, and I try to understand like she's going through, I'm hurt. So I know she has to be going through even more pain and it's hard. I think a lot of people forget in this fight um, when dealing with me and my family is that um, we didn't ask to be in this fight. We're not just joining this fight. We were forced into this fight. So I think a lot of people like sometimes forget like 
this isn't just a name that we picked up. Like, this is actually, you know, our baby. This is like my, my twin, my brother. Like, I take this serious. Like, it, it's my twin. And yeah, I just try to hold my mom close. That's it. So, and, and that picture I think you sent, sent me, I think y'all was little kids. Oh, you know, yeah. Was that, so how many, do y'all guys have more brothers and sisters? Yes, my mom had six kids. Um, so now it was four boys and two girls. So now it's three boys and two girls. I'm the oldest now. Okay, so how are they taking it as far as, you know? Um, um, we were... Our our relationship is real close. Like we were very close, even with my cousins. Like we all was born and raised in the same household, so it's never cousins. Like we're all brothers and sisters. Okay. So yeah. it affects the whole family. Like you can see it. You can see, it. and I think a lot. That's a lot of it too. Why a lot of them don't like invest themselves one hundred percent into this fight because they're going through something mentally too. And this isn't something that happened in another state. We have to ride, we walk and ride by this area where he was executed at every day. So, so y'all still live in the same area. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like it's here. Like it's no getting away from it. So we just hold each other co close. We laugh, we cry, we fight, we argue, you know. <laughs> we we get through it the best way that we can. Um and we try to keep his name alive. So do you do you ever get discouraged, you know, in, in, in the fight for justice? And if you do, what 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 keeps you going? Oh man, discouraged. Yes, I get discouraged. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I would have to say what keeps me going is my husband will not let me give up. I mean, I got married with my mega horn. I walked down the aisle with my mega horn. Okay? <laughs> um, <laughs> so I am fully invested in my best friend Christina Kelly. She is like my number one, like, oh my, she's like the number one person. Like she, if I'm getting discouraged, she picks up the pieces and like, no, like kick me in my butt. Like, no, you better keep going. Like we ain't got time for this. And what made me like draw me closer to her is because the first thing she said, she's white. Okay. And she was like, um, yeah, no, we're going to get this done. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to fight for justice and we're going to get this done because I'm going to use my white privilege that they claim I was born with. And we're going to get this together. And I love that about her. And, you know, she has an uncle who was a police officer. So she brings a different, you know, stance from all of this. And she we all went to the same school, too. So she knows Bam Bam. Jeremy McDowell, she knows them. So it's like. Being discouraged is it's hard because police brutality and violence happens every day. So you always have something to do. So you there's like you can't you can't get discouraged. You got to keep going. Yeah. And shout out to Christina as well. And shout out to Jay Renee. And shout out to everybody who's watching Harry Picasso Ray. Now, y'all actually had a press conference uh, today. Now, what, yes. what was that? The three Strooges, Jay Renee, Christina Kelly, and Keandra McDowell. They already know when we come together. They already know. Um, it was basically um informing the public and telling the community about um JM police reform now. We had just had a um budget hearing about the women's and police, how much money they was going to get for the year, um, Monday. And they're asking for more money. So we were just thinking that it was 60.2 million that our woman's and police was getting. 60? 60? Six, yes. 60, yeah, 60.2 million. They wanted to, they were asking for another 2.4 million to be added to that 60. Yeah, point. Yeah. Okay. So we was bringing in the public, the, the informing the public on like, we need them to stand up and say, no, this is not what we want. Um, um, more police funding the police is not going to equal a safer community for us. Like, no, it's not like put more money back into our communities. Y'all put y'all, they don't even put 4% of that into parks and recreation, like programs that fund it, that's funded for the youth and for, for stuff for them to do, um, that they need in the city. It's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. That's what the press release is about. And I think I read read somewhere on, on somebody's social media that they were asking for like a hundred and something thousand dollars for just bullets. I think somebody. Oh, um, yeah, that was Christina. That. She's excellent. She's a computer warrior. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And, and that's what a lot want more bullets to kill us. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And a lot of people don't understand you have to really dig deep into what they want the money for. It's not just, 
you know, exactly. they're, they're getting the money, but you got to really investigate, okay, where is this money going? From? And they're good with that. And this is something that we're seeing frequently with every police agency nationwide is that they tell you the amount that they want, but they kind of hide exactly what they want it for under something else. Like at the budget hearing, they were basically trying to glorify that they were um, removing seven positions in the Wilmington Police Department, which will save us about 600 and something thousand dollars. But then came back and sneakily threw in that they need an extra two point something million dollars. You know what I'm saying? So what are we winning? Okay, yeah, you're actually you're losing a yeah. lot, a lot. Yeah. So, so what's next for you know family the JM police reform now? Um, that is a good question. That is a good question. Um, this week we had so much going on. Um, we actually had three billboards being put up in the city to inform the community community on um how much money the police department gets, um, where the money should be going to, and um, yeah, what our community needs, which we need meaningful police reform. Um, I don't know exactly what is next on the list. Um, this is a learning experience as we go, so we kind of all come to a group. There is no um, head person in charge. We're all equal. So um, we just come up, sit down in a group, and figure out the next steps. I hope it's going to be another billboard with my brother's face on it, but I don't know if that'd get approved. Okay. Oh, so did y'all try to get one with this face on? Because I know you mentioned like, you know, you had, you got three billboards up now and you said you were going back and forth with, I guess the city or the police or somebody. Um, be up. Word, I really want that billboard to go up um, around the time that the Jeremy McDowell day event is going to be happening September 24th. Um, which is a free community event that we do. We try to put on for the community every year, every other year. Um, it's free food. It's um, games, prizes for adults and kids. It's moon bounces, balloon twisters, activity tables. We block off the streets so kids can safely run back and forth across the street till they tire themselves out. It's a whole bunch of candy and fruits, a little bit of vegetables. Um, it's just a day for the kids, like a family block party. So how long have y'all been doing that? Um, we started that in 2016. We do um, community Easter egg hunts. We do community Valentine's Day parties. We do community raffles where we might just jump on Facebook and decide to do a raffle and have people pick a number from one to 20. And whoever guesses the right number, they get a nice prize. So we just we do anything to get back to the community because that's just what we're here for, to uplift the community. And my brother loved helping people. I couldn't stand it that much because he always gave his last. I mean, his last. He'd be hungry, giving somebody his last to go eat, and he's hungry. But we try to keep um, that still going on through through his name. So that's what we do. And and back just back, back to the case since you mentioned Bam again. You mentioned something about the medical examiner too, right? Mm-hmm. Did, did, did he, um did so he, um the it's two things the ballistic guy who the one whoever that they hired to check the fingerprints and the ballistic of the gun the ballistics of the gun carl room mm -hmm. so carl room was brought up on charges and fired from um their department because he was falsifying evidence and falsifying time so now we have a crooked cop who shot my brother for changing. We have a crooked cop who's later been brought up on charges for changing the barrel of his gun. And then the ballistic guy in my brother's case is brought up on charges for falsifying evidence, not in my brother's case, but just, you know, happened to whatever. That goes and for falsifying yeah. time and evidence. Yeah, that's so that goes to show his character. Yeah, that, and I know. thought that that alone would be enough to, you know, reopen my brother's case because we have the ballistic guy who claimed that, you know, the, the gun was planted. We know it's not his, but he was the one who touched the gun. So we never, yeah, I thought that that would be enough for them to go back and reopen the case a third time, but it's not. Because what I learned is there is no statutory limit on murder. That's what I want other families to understand. 
So while they telling you that it's a limit, uh, a limit for this and that, and this and that, there's no limit on murder. So you always can go back and have your loved one's case reopened if you find evidence to do so. So don't get discouraged. Whether it's 20 years from now, it's a possibility that, hey, an officer might be in a bar talking and slip up and say something and admit to what he did wrong. And he can be brought up on charges for murder. And so, so you did. You, so you mentioned because actually, y'all did get it reopened, right? Mm -hmm. And how long ago was that, or how long ago was that after? Uh, that was in, I believe, it was 2020 when we got the case back open. It was four years later because that's when she released the picture of this planted gun. Um, basically she did absolutely nothing. Um, the reason why we asked for the case to be back open is because we had a couple new witnesses who, um, who came forward and she basically went with the first, the former attorney general's, um, ruling basically, and no cops was charged again. So, so. did she allow those witnesses to present evidence? Oh yeah, she allowed them. They um they spoke with them because in the beginning I was like, no, like you gotta lock into reopening my brother's case. I'm not gonna give you the witnesses' names so that you can somehow women's and police can find out who the witnesses are. And now it's retaliation. And now you got these witnesses terrified to tell or say what they need to say. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened. She reopened the case and then we gave her the names of the witnesses. And they did have they met with the witnesses or whatever and still came to the same conclusion. Okay. So um Chris Christina, I think, said that y'all plan on negotiating some some legislation. That's, That's the part. That's the next step, legislation. Um, protesting and everything, it does work. I don't want to discourage nobody from protesting because I still protest at the drop of a dime. Um, but legislation is where you really want to be involved in and start changing laws and stuff to, to, to protect other people in the future. And that's where we are focusing um, a lot of our time at now is legislation, just learning the process and and different things to see what senators we have on our team, which ones we don't, who are for police reform, meaningful police reform. Let me rephrase that. Who isn't, who we going to need to um, bird dog or apply more pressure to, to make sure that they jump on the board with what's right and stop allowing what's wrong to keep on happening. Mm -hmm. And you did mention a couple of city city politicians that are actually on your side, right? What, yes. What, um, what? like today we had our um city council president Trippy woo -woo, Trippy Congo. Um, he has been for police reform um since day one. He has been um by my family side since day one. And we have a councilwoman by the name of Charnay Darby. Amazing. Um, she actually got elected. And running her whole campaign was running on police reform, meaning police reform, defund the police. And she lives in a district here in um the city of Wilmington. That's a whole bunch of older people. Mm -hmm. And she got elected into position. So we have been like side by side together, like trying to figure this thing out. And she's learning, too. So we're all learning together. So she's younger. Oh, yeah. She's my age. I'm like 34. I think Darby might be a little younger than me, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's that's good that you have people on your side. And once again, back back to a situation that, that you talked about earlier about the seven. I'm not going to mention the amount, but do you get people coming after, you, you know, your family, you know, you know, for 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 financial reasons or, or has that all passed over? And if so, how do you handle that? No, um, that I don't, I believe that's going to, um, always be because, you know, people, the news people, basically when they release the amount of money that we got back from the settlement, that's basically in the hood, in hood language, setting a price tag on somebody's head, putting a bounty on somebody's head. Yeah. So, yeah. um, it never stops, but we did come to an agreement with everybody in the community. Like this money, there's no way to turn this money into good money. It's blood yeah. money. So the only way to make this money positive or the only way to make the money positive is to find a way to flip it to be good, to help the community and to do what we do. We do free community events all year long. Mm -hmm. um, people always come forward. Um, I'm like a, 
I didn't know this until now, but I'm like, uh, I always feel so I have to help people. I guess my brother jumped into my body. So now, you know, I wasn't with that at first, but <laughs> so I'm always like with my husband, like, babe, you see that child with no shoes? Like, come on, let's go to Walmart. Let's go get him a whole bunch of shoes and just drop them off at the doorstep or something. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just the type of people that we are. We always will help out. And try not to turn anybody down, especially if they come to you and say it's for a light bill or food. How are you going to say, no, I can't help you? Like, you got babies? Like, no. So. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of family, because you said you actually you met uh, your husband, Mr. Picasso Ray, uh, during a protest. Is that right? Yes. Um, no, I met him um, a couple days before my brother's funeral. We were trying to get T-shirts made. Okay. And um, he had a shop and we went there last minute. We needed all these shirts made and um, went there and asked them. And ever since then, asked him, could he do the shirts? And he agreed to it. And then we grew a bond. And ever since then, it's like protest. He does all of our shirts. Um, he does all of our signs. He airbrushes our signs. Um, and we just fell in love, I guess. OK, so he was there with you during a very difficult time. Uh, so oh, yes. Yes. Pray for that man, y'all. Pray for that man because he gets it all. Like he gets the, y'all get this uh, this side of Key Andrew. He gets it all. The emotions, the the when I want to cuss somebody out and can't really do it out in public, you know, I got to do it behind closed door. He gets it all. So he he's strong. He I don't understand. I don't know how he does it sometimes because he sees me break down and cry when a lot of people don't. They just see me as this person in the street fighting, 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 fighting. But nobody really gets to see that side of me. So he does. So he's, yeah, he's awesome. Yeah, when they say good people. So now, so you have two children of your own, right? Oh, yeah. My children are ready for the world, too. Yes. <laughs> are, are you teaching them about, you know, what happened? or like, How old are they, first of all? My kids are three and four. So do they really understand what it is that you do? I or? wish they was up so you can ask them that question and they can answer <laughs> it for you. Um, they know about Uncle Bam Bam. They know um, how many times he was shot. They know um, about the movement. They know that when mommy is dead, is gone, dead and gone, that you are to continue on this movement. They know how to operate a megaphone. <laughs> they know about crooked cops. They know about good cops, and they know about questionable cops. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, my daughter. Yeah, and my son are ready. <laughs> I saw like the social media post earlier where they had the megaphones, and they was they was like, "What you say? You say crooked cops?" <laughs> I was not expecting for her to say that, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so she, yeah, you must hear that a lot. Yeah, um, they hear a lot of my chants that I do at my protests. Um, they see me on the news a lot. Um, on Facebook, they yeah, so they're yeah. Oh, okay. So you take them to the actual protest, like this? No, 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 no. Um, okay. I wouldn't be able to refrain if anything happened while at the protest. A protest, we um hold peaceful protests. Nothing's popped off or went crazy because we we. Stand on peaceful protest. Now we might irritate you, but they're peaceful protests. But I just don't feel comfortable of having my um children out there because while we're protesting, it's people riding by sticking up their middle fingers, um, yelling um racial um, racial slurs. And um one time um we got into it with the Proud Boys, somebody pulled a gun out on us. Wow. Um so yeah, and it was a peaceful protest. So I try to keep all kids, even other people that were standing beside. I tell them no kids involved because you never know what can happen. Being an activist is a very dangerous job. Yes. And we need for everybody to understand that. Um, when you see an activist, like just know that their life is on the line and protect them by any means necessary because they're not working behind behind the scenes, they're on the front lines. And when you take that role on, I'm gonna be an activist, you, you're you basically signing up for it all. So yeah. no, I wouldn't, I would tell other people not to bring their kids to protest. I don't think that that's a um, good place, but they could watch it live and stuff. Okay, okay. And just, you know, referring back to them, because once again, this, this is, this is, you know, who it's about. What what do you, how, how do you think he would feel about what you're doing in, in his name? That is a question that I constantly ask myself. Um, 
I don't know. Like, I'm, it's sometimes I can feel like it feels like 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 his presence. I can feel like when I feel like he's here and he sees me doing it. Um, a lot of people say that I know that he's proud of you. I wish I had a sister like you. But I don't know. I, I really don't know because I don't know. That's something I can't answer. I, that's a question that I would love to know, but that's just something that I can't yeah. answer. And it, this here you mentioned that because, like I said, like I told you the first night we talked and you sent me all the information and the reports and articles, and I told you I, I just couldn't sleep. So I, I had to get up and start yeah. reading. You why I, that was bam, bam, messing with you. He was a prankster. Like, he believed in jokes. Like, he was one of them jokesters. Like, he always had a prank or always smile, always had something. He, it irritated me, but made other people laugh. But, yeah, he was a prankster. He loved kids. Like, he was just, he was a good guy. Like, his record, yeah, was something different. But him personally, like, to, like, if you met him, you wouldn't think that you know, judge him by his record, you'll be like, yo, he's an awesome guy. Like, he's funny as heck. Like, can you come to my house? Come to the barbecues. Like, you got me laughing all day. But Yeah, I got it. And I understand just like uh, my brother, uh, I forgot his name, the sit-down interview. I think Jay Renee told me his name. That that, that what you was, uh, the, the one who did the interview that I kept kept referring to when we talked. Hanif? No, not Hanif. Um, the one that oh, you, Jay Street, Jay, Jay Street. Street, yeah. So he he mentioned about you know like like smoking weed and, and having a ref like it's really like weed is almost legal, and um, you know so people try to you know it it, it always seems like they try to uh, vilify or criminalize somebody after they're dead. Say okay, well he had a ref, he smoked weed, which really doesn't matter. Um, they put my mom's mugshot. Like the the crazy part about it is, is that they put my brother's mugshot out there, but they put my mom's mugshot out there. Like it was like every day the news people were trying to, like hurt my mom, put her in a depression or something, to make her try to kill herself or something. I don't know with the with the the way that they was going about things. And like I said, <laughs> Christina said he's smiling on her like he did today over the billboards. Yes. So, and, and like I said, I've been shy. I got a record like terrible, probably, you know, worse than both you, you know, everybody. But I, I you know, I've been shot and everything. So just, just going back to Bam again, how was he shot the first time? Um, Like I said, Bam Bam always loved helping people. A boy came down here from St. Croix, Virgin Islands, and him and Bam Bam got cool and became friends. And this whole time, Bam Bam was selling weed or whatever, and the boy got jealous of him. He wanted what Bam Bam got. And he came to Ronnie Street to get Bam Bam. They walked up to the Chinese store to get a Dutch. Walked down a different street. Next thing you hear, next thing you hear, you hear six shots go off. Pow, 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 pow. I was the one who found my brother. Um, six shots. He got shot six times in the back with a 40 caliber. Wow. At right the around age, the corner. At the age of 18 and survived. Yeah. It didn't look like that because they had to rush him in. Um, they had to keep his body open for like a week because they said if they closed them, then so he was swollen so much that, yeah, he would his body would explode because he was swollen so bad. But yeah, um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's how he got shot. Jealousy. Um, the boy end up getting caught. The um, U.S. Marshals end up going to the Virgin Islands and um, getting a boy, and he's currently serving um, thirty seven years here. And then when he leaves here, he has to serve a life sentence from killing somebody in the Virgin Islands. Yeah. Oh, so he God was bless just, you. Thank you. Yeah. So he was just a rogue. Yeah. So okay. how do you, I, I know, like you said, in the, um, you know, because that was like 10 years later, you know, when, when the police executed him. But of course, that had to be hard for him at first. Um, how did I, you, I think it's it, it hurted us more than him. Um, I remember the first day that he woke up. And um, we had to tell him that he was paralyzed. And one tear came down his eyes. And then after that, he was like, so I'm going to have to use one of them wheelchair things. So I guess I'm going to be just popping willies on my dang life then. And ever since then, his exact words. And ever since then, it's like he, it was like motivation. Like he had it, he, he knew that that was his legs. Like the wheelchair was his legs. So he adapted to it more normal the doctors were even surprised because he was in the hospital for about nine months after he got shot uh -huh. 
we're learning how to um to how to operate and stuff like that. When my brother was executed, he was living at a nursing home. I don't think I said that. Yeah, you did. Yeah, he was living at a nursing home. From him sitting in his wheelchair for so long, he got um bed sores. Mm -hmm. And the bed sore was down um by his butt area. Mm -hmm. And it got infected with MRSA. So he was what is MRSA. That's um it's basically like I guess a uh, like a blood eating disease or something, like from an infection. Okay. And um being as though it's it's normal for paraplegics being so they sit down a lot. And he didn't move. So they had him in a nursing home to try to dry, make the bed sore dry out some so that it can heal. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. How long was he staying there before? before the he was, I believe he was in a nursing home, maybe about two months, maybe. He wasn't in there alone. He had just got out the hospital from the bed sore. Okay. So that situation just came. Oh, up. and yes. And the police raided his, went there and went through his room at the nursing home looking for a gun. Okay. After they've already said, okay, he had a gun, there's no reason to, to go. Yeah. With. Um, we got, because, um, my mom was his emergency contact down at the nursing home. So she got a call from one of the nurses that the police was in Jeremy's room right now and had the whole facility on lockdown, wouldn't allow nobody to go down the hallway. And they were searching his room. The nurse said she kept asking the police, why are y'all here? What are y'all doing? We have other clients down this hall we got to get to. And they said that nobody was going down that hall. They believed there was a gun in this room. And that was my brother's room. But they never found a gun. Yeah. And, and so so why did they call him Bam Bam? Where did you get that <laughs> Um. <laughs> <laughs> when my mom was carrying him, he used to always punch her stomach, she said. So she would always be like, bam, bam. And that's how he got his name. They used to call me Pebbles. I changed that name. Like, we're not going to do this, okay? Bam, bam, Pebbles, no, it's not happening. No. Yeah, so that's how he got his name. Because he used to always punch on my mom's belly when he was in her stomach. She said that's how he got his name. Man, that's, that's awesome, man. And, you know, I, I just appreciate your attitude and you know, the, the way you are able to talk about the subject with passion, but also, you know, um, have have a sense of sense of humor about it, uh, because I know that that's a delicate balance, man. But I just want to commend you. I'm, I'm going to let you go because I know you got kids. That be there. Oh, my kids been asleep at seven o'clock. We got curfew. Here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. But we're um, going to go ahead. I'm sorry. I just want to say thank you for allowing. um for i say my family to come on here and um allow people to to see the truth you know just just taking the time i would like to thank everybody who's been watching for taking the time out to actually being curious and learning about what took place instead of believing the narrative that was pushed out there for september 23rd 2015. that's the easy route to go yeah um and I would just like to say thank you. Like, if anybody has any other questions, if you have questions, like you forgot to ask me a question, you know, I'm an open book, text me whenever. I will respond. Don't text me, call me because you know how yeah. that goes. But, yeah. and I will tell it, it's like my brother is living through me. Somebody told me in the beginning that I need to, to put my pain into a movement. Don't allow the pain to consume you. You put your pain into the movement. And that's what I've been doing since day one. I'm finishing my brother's story. Definitely, man. And we're gonna we're gonna continue that story. Um, like I said, I want to do a you know totally separate you know story. It's so that. much more, like <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's so much more. You know, this this I, I knew we might have to bring you on again, but uh, you know, until then, man. You know, like I said, if there's anything that you know we can do here, just let us know. Um, you know, I want to thank everybody who stood beside you. I uh, thank everybody who's watching, Jay, Renee, Aaron, Christina, my father, Felicia. Just thank everybody, you know, for just taking the time out. People who are, you know, will, will go back and look at this, man, because once again, this is a story that, that that you know, get, get kind of swept up in everything that, every you know, that goes on on a day-to-day -day basis. But, you know, we have people out here who, who really, you know, deserve, you know, some attention and some justice, and you know, who, who are still fighting and, you know, fighting for what is right. And and, and that is, uh, you know, most importantly, police reform, like meaningful police reform. Don't just, you know, take them to the, 
you know, the history of African American museum. <laughs> Say, okay, well, yeah, that's, right. yeah, you know that. Okay, they've been trained now. No, you know, we really, you know, change policies, change, uh, you know, you know, change uh, everything. You know, Felicia Mrs. Mitchell says, "God bless you for your strength, and may God surround you with everlasting peace." Thank you. Definitely, I thank you guys for watching. Thank you. And uh, we're gonna end the broadcast now, but uh, Carla Davis, thank you, says thank you. I needed to hear this, um, so thank, thank you, you. Well, Davis. So yeah, we're gonna. Um, is there anything else that you want to uh, leave with the audience before we go? Just if you know a family that is experiencing a loved one, you know, like murder by police brutality or just murder in general, because we have a lot of that going around in different cities. Um, unity is the cure. I say this over and over and over. What do I think needs to happen? We need to unite no matter race, color, religion, sex. It doesn't matter. We all need to unite. That is the cure. Unite. If we all come together and fight this together, the only way is up from here like it's time for us to put all the other stuff to the side and come together as we the people and let's get this government the way that it should be definitely and that is liberty and justice for oh. all they say so i want to thank you again my sister um you know like i said with anything i can do just let me know and we'll be talking again soon and i guess i'll see all of our viewers uh here next week uh we shall have a blessed and prosperous uh, week, rest of the end of the week. And we thank you for tuning in. Thank you.